can't stand in front of the screen. <laughs> Is that okay? Sorry. Cool. All right. Thank you all for coming over here. And uh, uh, I'm JD Sawyer with Colorado Aquaponics. And we're going to talk briefly today about uh, raising fish and plants together uh, sustainably. Uh, so we're going to just give you a basic overview of, of what that looks like. We'll look at some different systems. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the impact of food and our food uh, system these days. So aquaponics is the integration of aquaculture, where you're farming aquatic species in a controlled environment, and hydroponics, where you're growing plants in soilless media. And what we're doing is we're actually really combining the best attributes of both of those systems. Some of those systems on their own have some inherent flaws. Uh, aquaculture can have a, problem, a problem with wastewater uh, disposal. Uh, intensive aquaculture and fish farming uh, can have issues with uh, the use of antibiotics and treatment methods. Um, so we actually promote really low density aquaponics systems. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, but when, we, when you have a wastewater problem with aquaculture, some of that water can just be released out into the environment and be very damaging to natural ecosystems. So what we're doing in aquaponics is actually using that wastewater and we're using that as a nutrient solution or a fertilizer solution for the plants. Now in hydroponics, when you're growing with soilless media, you're typically using synthetic chemical-based fertilizer and nutrient solutions that can be very expensive. Uh, and there's also a wastewater element with that with, that you have to discharge from those systems. Um, again, we're solving that problem because we have a natural sor source of, of, of fertilizer in raising the fish in our system. So we're really creating a polyculture or an ecosystem. We're just replicating a natural ecosystem uh, with aquaponics. So we're raising fish in a fish tank. We've got our example right next to us here. Down below, we've got a nice little 100-gallon fish tank there. And we're pumping water from that fish tank up to the grow beds where we grow the plants. And we're growing without soil in these systems. These are soilless systems. So you'll get a chance to look at some of the different types of media that we use, uh, lava rock, river rock, or expanded clay pebbles, uh, expanded shale. Uh, are common uh, media that you might use in a typical flood and drain system. Um, we'll look at a couple other methods too. But what happens on all that media in those grow beds is that naturally occurring bacteria actually convert ammonia, which is present in fish waste, they convert that through a two-step process into nitrates uh, for, for your plants. And so the beds, your grow beds, actually serve as a natural biological filter for the fish they're cleaning the water for the fish, providing nutrients for the plants. The plants are cleaning the water for the fish. They're happy and productive. And so you're getting nice filtered water. And the, one of the key benefits here is that we're recirculating that water over and over and over again. So we use a fraction of the water that we otherwise would use in traditional soil-based agriculture, which is one time, excuse me, one time use. We're recirculating it. So we're using five to 10% of the water to grow the same amount of plants. So it's an excellent, excellent method for growing and conserving water. Here's a picture of a, a system that we have. And I should say right now, we actually run um, an aquaponics farm only a few blocks from here at a, a place called The Grow House, which is a nonprofit urban farm and market in the Elyria Swansea neighborhood here. It's a neighborhood that's actually classified as a food desert. There's no grocery stores. There's really very difficult time accessing any healthy food at all. And that leads to a lot of significant issues, uh, diabetes, childhood obesity, that sort of thing. So the mission and purpose of the Grow House is to provide access and awareness around healthy food. And so uh, we're at 47th and York Street. If you visit our website at Colorado Aquaponics, we offer free tours. We do a lot of our classes there. Um, we have demonstration scale systems and we also have some large scale farms uh, as well that you'll get a chance to look at. So this is one of our systems that we've had for running uh, now three years at the grow house. And you can see we have uh, about a 300 gallon tank here. That's white Rocky Mountain Nile tilapia. And we've got three grow beds wrapping around the outside of this tank here. 
and we're growing a wide variety of produce. So fish are happy, plants are happy, um, everyone's helping each other out. The reason why this is important is we've got some issues with our uh, current food production system. And I'm not going to soapbox on that too much because I think you're probably aware of those issues. Uh, and this is why aquaponics is important. Um, we manufacture a lot of our fertilizers, which is a horridly toxic process. We use a lot of fossil fuels in the manufacturing of those fertilizers. A lot of those fertilizers that we have to put on our farmland are end up washing down the Mississippi River. And then you, if you see this satellite view down here, these are algal blooms or algae blooms in the Gulf of Mexico. That's from runoff from the Mississippi ris uh, River as a result of a lot of those uh, ammonia-based fertilizer solutions. So that can be very damaging to ecosystems when you have these algae blooms that starve those oxygen uh, environments of oxygen. A big issue is food transportation too. Um, healthy food and most of our food comes from 1,500 to 2,000 miles away. So we're reliant on the transportation network, which is again fossil fuel driven. Um, that has tremendous impacts on the quality of the crops and the food that we eat, all the packaging, the processing, all the steps that go into that. And then we end up getting a food of which is poor quality and poor nutritious value. When you grow food right in your own home, you're going to have the highest uh, density nutrient based food, the freshest food, the best tasting food. It's going to be right there at your own home. And you're going to minimize the carbon footprint and all the is is issues associated with that transportation. And when that transportation network goes down, I didn't say if, I said when it goes down or something severely disrupts that, you know, what are you going to do? You know, we got to think about how we're going to be able to ra raise and protect our own food supply. You know, a typical meal that you could actually be producing in your own aquaponic system, tilapia, we've got some tilapia over here, some koi, uh, salad greens, of course, tomatoes, herbs, strawberries. These are all products that you could be growing in your own home-based aquaponic system. But if you look at where these, these products typically come from, the places of origin and the, the, dif the distance, you're talking over 16,000 miles for a plate of food just like something you can grow right in your own backyard or right in these communities where we're in that need this food the most. Uh, so that's significant. So let's talk about a few of the benefits. So I already touched on the water conservation piece. I think that's one of the most significant ones. We use a fraction of the water to grow a tremendous amount of food. Um, we don't use any chemicals or pesticides or fertilizers because we really can't. You're creating an ecosystem here. We've got fish in the equation. We have beneficial bacteria that we're cultivating and we have to protect. And if we start using pesticides and chemicals in there, we're going to destroy that ecosystem. So this is really a very natural, very organic way to grow your own food and avoid the use uh, of, of those types of uh, uh, chemical-based fertilizers. Um, we don't have any issues with soil-borne diseases, typically E. coli and sal salmonella. That, those, are, those are pathogens that are not native to fish culture to begin with. Okay? You could introduce those if you aren't practicing good hygiene, but raising fish and plants in a soilless environment can actually you know, be, be much better in that regard and much safer, um, less risk of pathogens uh, contaminating the food. Um, no fish contamination or species de depletion. We have an opportunity to protect and raise our own fish and breed our own fish, have our own fish supply, and stop overfishing our oceans. Um, this is one I love, less physical labor, okay, because I'm kind of lazy. You know? And one of the key benefits here is that you know, now that we're not gardening in the dirt, and by the way, we're not against dirt gardening, it's all part of it, you know, but you're looking at this here, this is raised bed soilless gardening. Gardening. So we're not weeding anymore, we're not bending over. I have a bad back, that's one of the reasons why I got into this in the first place, because I was really turned on by the idea of harvesting right here at waist height. Okay, so that's a great, a great feature. Um, of course, you're growing a protein and a produce source together in the same system. So now with fish and plants together, we really have a complete meal you know, in one food production system. We get greater crop yields and faster production. 
because these plants are continuously getting nutrient-rich water at the root zone and they don't have to fight to find the water, they're not contending with other weeds or other plants uh, in the soil, then we're experiencing two to three times the growth rate over traditional agriculture. So one method that, that we use that you'll be able to see at the farm, uh, in addition to growing plants in the media-based grow beds, we also float plants right on water. Um, so we use these raft sheets here. I'm going to hold this up. And you can see these holes that are in here. So we actually start all our plants in little plug trays. You guys want to hold up that plug tray there so they can take a look at that. So we start our seeds in a plug tray. And then we can, when they're ready to transplant, usually they're two to three inches to, uh, in height, we just take those little plugs out and we drop them right in these holes in the raft sheet here. On this particular sheet, there's 28 holes. So you get three and a half plants per square foot. So particularly if you're interested, um, certainly not only in home-based aquaponics, but in doing a larger scale farm and getting into maybe even a commercial size operation, you can very accurately project how much food you're going to grow on a weekly or monthly or annual basis and know exactly what your planting density is per square foot, which is an important measurement in looking at the economics of the farm, among other things. So that's, that's significant. We reduce those food transportation miles. We talked about that. We're getting greater nutrition out of our food. It works in places with drought or poor soil quality. Pretty important here, pretty important in most parts of the world that are struggling with water. Um, in Colorado, certainly an issue here. Uh, and it helps to enhance the local economy too. You know, in particular, if you come and visit us at the farm, you know, we're creating jobs through urban agriculture, urban sustainable agriculture. Jobs are pretty important right now too. So we have the opportunity to, to train our, our, our youth, get our kids involved, and train the next generation of our workforce to be growing our own food right in our backyards, right in the communities that need it the most, and keeping the jobs and the money localized in our own economy. Here are some of the basic components that we typically find in a home-based aquaponics system. And when you start in aquaponics, we recommend start small. The first system I ever built was a 20-gallon aquarium. Um, not this one, but close to this. There's a little aquarium under there with a little two by four uh, square foot grow bed on top. And so we're looking at a fish tank and a, a proper place to grow plants. And this is, of course, important. Plants need sunlight, uh, a greenhouse, a sunroom. Or if you do this in your, your basement, you can use artificial lighting systems for the plants. Uh, you need a water pump and irrigation tubing to move that water from your fish tank to your grow bed. So again, you can get a chance to see that working in action over here. Um, we often include a little air pump and an air stone, uh, or in particularly a battery backup air pump. Uh, if the power goes out, you can still have air uh, and oxygen being delivered to your fish. They do need dissolved oxygen to survive. Um, so a little battery-based air pump is a good idea. Uh, you may or may not need a, a water heater, depending on the type of fish uh, that you're using in your system and your ability to control the temperature in your, in your growing environment. Uh, again, a grow light is optional. Uh, of course, you're going to need fish and plants at some point once it's all set up. Uh, fish food and water quality test kits. Um, these are all things we have at the grow house. Uh, when you are getting started with your aquaponic system, uh, we, we supply fish, tilapia, or koi, and we can also bring in other fish like bluegill and trout and bass are good popular fish too. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but those are typical components. So it's pretty basic, and I'll tell you, obviously we sell uh, little kit systems, but if you're a do-it-yourselfer, this is like the dream do-it-yourselfer project. Plumbing, construction, you know, that we build systems out of wood, out of metal. There's a lot of different ways to to design these. So we'll, we'll, we'll blow through a few slides of different pictures here. Um, here's a picture of the system, again, that's right next to us here without the plants in it, so you can actually see the grow bed media. And then there's one under, under lights in a basement. Picture didn't come out so great, but at least you get the, get the idea. Um, so this is a really common flood and drain system. You're flooding that grow bed and draining it. And we often use a little siphon mechanism called a bell siphon that we create 
uh, out of simple PVC parts, and that allows the water to flood and drain up and down in those grow beds so the plants get water, but then it drains out so they get air and oxygen to the root zone, and that goes back and forth. And it's a very, very simple uh, mechanism. When you're getting into larger scale systems, typically community or commercial scale systems uh, utilize a method called deep water culture. Uh, again, at our farm at the grow house, we actually have a combination system of grow beds and deep water culture. But deep water culture is where you float the plants on the raft. So I just showed you these raft sheets here. These float right on top of 10 to 12 inches of water. And with that, rather than having, you know, you know, miles and miles of gravel media, now you're just talking big water troughs. And this is a picture over here of a system, uh, uh, one of the earliest research systems at the University of the Virgin Islands. And you can probably tell that if you look towards the far end, you have smaller growth plants. And then right down towards the bottom, you have some of the larger mature growth. Well, at our farm, it, it's set up exactly the same way. So you're, all, you're all always harvesting out of the same end of the trough. And then when you harvest, we just put these raft sheets up on little uh, sawhorses cut our product off, bag it, put it in the cases, take it to our restaurant or market customers. And then we take this raft and drop it in the far end and transplant the little seedlings in there. And you just push the whole shooting match, all the boards right down the trough. And it's like one big giant conveyor belt. So now you're talking a little bit more of almost a manufacturing process really. But again, you have a very predictable harvest now and it's very easy to work with on a large scale. Now you can do this on a small scale too with a little tub, so don't get me wrong, but when you get into larger systems, this is very practical. So it's really not a huge energy footprint either. You could run that off of that solar panel grid probably right behind us. So the, the question is, because um, we talked about how the roots get air in the flood and drain system, well, then logically, if the root system is in the water constantly, then they're always submerged, right? Yeah, so what we do with that is, about every four to eight feet, we just have little air stones. Um, so we have a, a, an air blower that's sending out um, oxygen, dissolved oxygen to the water. So long as there's enough ox available oxygen in the water, the root system is fine. And so the plants can get oxygen through the transfer of that in the water column. So now you don't even necessarily need air stones up and down the troughs as long as you have a good flow rate. That's the kind of stuff we get into in system design and engineering that we're not going to get into today. But that's a good question. Uh, you can grow in water at all times, you know, as long as there's good oxygen. And again, this is all the same nutrient-rich fish water that's cruising through this whole, whole network here. Um, this is another exciting uh, growing method. We have an example on the, the vertical tower over here uh, on the other side. Um, these are uh, called zip grow towers uh, and, and the opportunity to grow up now and conserve space. If you have a limited footprint, you can grow your plants vertically and get more plant production per square foot. Um, so these are five foot towers. We have a number of these at the farm. Uh, they're excellent for growing herbs and salad greens. Uh, strawberries um, are, do really well in these towers uh, and they can all be part of the equation. Um, to really fill out, you know, your, your whole system. Um, so we're excited about that. You know, here's another potential solution for aquaponic systems too, uh, you know, is fodder-based systems. You know, if you're raising cattle, you're doing grass-fed beef, uh, or for whatever animals you're raising, you know, you can have the opportunity to grow your own feed for your animals relatively inexpensively. Uh, if from what I've heard recently, the cost of hay and feed has just gone through the roof. And then again, you have another transportation network, uh, you know, dependency there in the chain. So you can use these same systems, either hydroponically or aquaponically, to grow your own feed source. Uh, as a matter of fact, we even provide food to the Denver Zoo because we're only about two miles down the road. So, you know, if some of our product, let's say, uh, you know, just didn't look, you know, good enough for the chefs or for the market, uh, the elephants and the monkeys don't really care, and they actually love it. Uh, so, and it's a great story for the zoo, too, so they get an opportunity to support a local business. Um, so let's talk a little bit about fish, too. So there's a variety of different fish uh, that we can use in, in our systems here. So if you're starting with a little, you know, desktop aquarium, you know, you can generally use a little aquarium fish. 
Um, but when you get into edible food fish, um, tilapia, perch, trout, catfish, bass, bluegill, carp, koi um, are all possibilities. Uh, freshwater uh, prawns. Um, one thing you can do in those deep water beds where the plants are floating is some people like to put prawns under there and they actually can help clean the root system uh, and help clean the tanks. They eat the detritus material, any other solid fish waste or organic matter. They'll actually help clean the system for you. Remember, you're creating an ecosystem, so biological diversity is actually your friend in most cases too. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that we can certainly coach you on and, and help you as you explore this uh, going forward. You know, most people uh, tend to focus on tilapia. Um, they're one of the most hardy, resilient fish. Um, they're, they're difficult to kill. We've, we've tried to kill them. They're hard, they're hard to kill. Um, but they can tolerate a wide variety of temperature swings, uh, pH changes, poor water quality. Um, you know, and they grow relatively fast. Uh, they're also an omnivorous fish, so they'll eat plant scraps, um, worms, duckweed. Uh, so a lot of times when we're harvesting vegetables out of our system, um, you know, we sometimes leaf some of those products out, or if we have some stunted, you know, heads, we just throw them right back in the fish tank, and the koi and the tilapia work off of those. Um, that's a really exciting area because, you know, the more we can have sustainable feed or even grow our own food for the fish, again, we're closing the loop and closing the dependency on manufactured uh, feed sources, okay? Uh, this is just an interesting graphic. In terms of feed conversion, um, fish is the most efficient uh, converter of feed in terms of the amount of food that it takes to grow a pound of, of flesh or biomass on the animal. It takes 1.7, on average, 1.7 pounds of feed to grow a pound of fish, okay, versus some other animals that have much higher feed conversion ratios. Uh, like goats or, or beef, that nine pounds of feed on average to grow a pound of flesh. So just an interesting graphic in terms of, of fish's ability to f be efficient in processed feed. Um, so in terms of the, the, the greens and the produce, um, almost anything that grows up is a possibility in aquaponics. Um, so here's a, a long list of items here of leafy greens. One of the things that's nice about uh, media-based systems is you have the opportunity in these gravel beds to grow almost anything. Tomatoes, peppers, squash, uh, lettuce varieties, chards, kale, herbs, strawberries, you name it. If it grows up, it grows really well uh, in these systems. So uh, these are, that's my daughter Emerson, by the way. That's my wife, Tanya. Um, so these are pictures. That, that's actually our old farm in Arvada. Um, so here's a whole list of herbs. Again, this is just a short list. There's a ton of other stuff. Um, so you can see some basil here. This is all mint. So when you lift up one of those rafts, you can see the whole root system, right? All hanging down there in the water. That's a whole raft of mint there. That's a lot of mint. So sell those for mojitos and, you know. Uh, and then you can see we got like dill, parsley, we can do a variety of uh, herbs in those vertical tower systems, which are, which are great for that. And again, I mentioned um, tomatoes, peas, squash, zucchini, uh, all kinds of fruiting crops, uh, just a wide variety of, of options to grow. Um, that being said, we often get the question too, well, can you grow potatoes and carrots? And for a while, the answer was sort of, eh, not really, they don't come out that great. Um, but, you know, through a lot of recent experimentation and other people in the industry, um, we've created some real neat things called wicking beds, which are basically, you know, you can, you can just put a soil-based bed on the end of your system or plumb it in as a, as a dead end, if you will. So you're not necessarily recirculating the water through the soil and back to the fish because we don't want to do that. But if you send aquaponic water to a little raised bed fodder system, or even sending it out to your traditional soil garden. Remember, you're, 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 you're making fertilizer. You're manufacturing your own natural fertilizer with fish. So you can use that anywhere. You can use that on your lawn for lawn care as an organic fertilizer for lawns, or you can start growing some root crops and use that you know, fertilizer solution in creative ways to now get your potatoes and carrots. So now we're really starting to fill out the whole the whole food production solution. 
Um, we do some really, uh, we do a lot of microgreens at the farm, which are pretty popular with some of our local restaurants and chefs. Um, very, very nutrient dense. Um, we grow them in, some, in 10 to 14 days, so they're very small, little micro kale or micro mustards or mixes. Uh, so they grow fast, they turn fast, and the chefs actually pay more for smaller product. It's like a win-win-win, uh, which is pretty cool for the farm. Uh, so we do a little bit of microgreen production, among other things, uh, as our main products. Some of the things that we need to be considering when we're talking about real, true sustainability, because the ultimate goal for, for us as an organization, and I think for you guys, is, well, I want a sustainable solution. I want a sustainable food production solution. So the ways to really make that happen is, hey, we just talked about the pump. You know, putting a simple solar panel, the battery backup system to run your water pump uh, is certainly one way to do it. Uh, there's even people designing foot-powered treadle pumps for use in, you know, developing countries and nations. But that's another, uh, you know, thing you can use in the case of a, a power outage. Um, the building and the environment is super important, um, particularly if you're up in high altitudes here or just dealing with the changes in the climate in Colorado. Uh, there's a few companies right here in this building, Series Building Solutions. Looking at Lindsay, right? <laughs> so thank you. And we've got their brochures at our desk. Um, but they're, they're developing energy-efficient buildings that can truly stand on their own. Um, and, you know, you guys can go visit their booth and learn more about the details of their construction. Uh, but they have a minimal, if not zero, energy footprint and can maintain appropriate temperatures uh, ranges from, what do you say, 50 to 80 degrees? Is that the kind of ballpark? Yeah. Yeah, so you can ma maintain the environment you need to grow plants and fish. And with a thoughtfully designed aquaponics system with a nice body of water in there, that water actually contributes to the thermal mass of the building and the building's ability to passively heat and cool itself. So an aquaponics system in a well-designed, sustainable, passive uh, solar greenhouse or energy efficient building uh, is really the, the, the holy grail, if you will, for sustainable food production. Obviously, we want to use the sun as much as possible. Uh, but if you're getting started doing this in your house, you can use uh, LED lights or artificial lighting. T5 lights are relatively energy efficient for your lights. Um, we also, you know, in terms of sustainability, sometimes it doesn't make sense to try to grow tomatoes in the dead of winter, although I'd argue it's possible and doable. And I know they've got a farm that does it in Boulder. Um, but at the same time, if you grow seasonally cold tolerant plants, then you don't have to overtax your heating system to try to keep up with that either. So still think seasonally about your crop choices. Uh, choosing fish feeds, again, with alternative protein sources, duckweed, um, any of the produce if they're omnivorous. Uh, we actually have some black soldier fly that's a composting fly. Um, so they'll eat compost and even meat scraps and all that. And the larva that they produce is actually a high protein natural fish feed. So you can really integrate the whole composting element to this as well with your waste food product and actually raise feed for your fish. Um, so those are some options there. Uh, here's a little bit about our farm at the, at the grow house. So we have 3,000 square feet, 11,000 gallons of water. We grow about 600 to 900 uh, plants a week um, for our community and for our restaurant customers. A couple thousand pounds of fish a, a year. Um, we do all kinds of modular, scalable design models. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to approach this depending on what your goals and objectives are. If you want to do a small scale or large scale, uh, that's something to talk to us about. This is the room. We, the, the grow house is a 20,000 square foot building. We occupy 3,000 square feet for the farm. So this is what we had to start with last summer. Uh, and the grow house is nonprofit, so it, we're raising money and you know, it takes a while. Um, so a couple pictures of the construction effort here. We got a nice donation from Colorado Health Foundation. Uh, these are a lot of our members, Holly, my wife, and a bunch of people that volunteered to help build the farm. Now here, here's what it looked like before we really populated it with, with fish and plants. And this will give you a good idea of kind of the water component here. This is a shot of the 1,000 gallon fish tank. 
And then this, this tank here, gravity feeds water down through these gravel-based beds. These are all those flood and drain beds I talked about earlier. Okay, that water then, when it drains out of these beds, drains out into these lower troughs here. And this is where we put these styrofoam boards and we float the, the plants on top of. And then the pump, I'm going to step over here for a sec. There's actually a pump in the far corner here. And that, this is the low point in the system. And that pumps the water back up to the top fish tank. And then we continue to recirculate. So we're continuously moving and gravity feeding that water throughout the system. So here's a shot of, this is February. And this is what the farm looks like today. But this is the middle of winter in February. And we've got you know, a pretty green room now. And you can also see, so this is all the deep water stuff. This is all the plants floating on the water. In the back here, those are the zip grow towers I talked about. So we've got some vertical integration here too. Um, so that's, uh, you know, the farm just keeps trucking along there. We do a lot of work with schools because our business, Colorado Aquaponics, is really founded on education. Uh, so again, teaching classes, we have one day intro to aquaponics courses all the way up to the four day course. But we do a lot of work with local schools as well because we really want to get our kids thinking about growing food again and learning. You know, we used to know, we either knew our farmer 50, 60 years ago or we farmed the food ourselves. And that's largely been stripped away from us now because of industrial, corporate controlled agriculture. Kids and people have been disconnected with food and we need to reestablish that connection. And there's not a better way to do that in a, in a school whether it's elementary all the way up to the university level, than putting an aquaponic system in the school, because now all of these different subject matters are present in an aquaponic system, particularly the STEM su subjects that we talk about a lot, science, technology, engineering, math, but nutrition, economics, botany, biology, of course, um, chemistry, uh, all of it. It's unbelievable how many interdisciplinary subjects are really intertwined uh, in aquaponics. So we're excited about the future and we really want to spread the message. Um, a little bit about what we do. Again, we, tr we provide training courses in aquaponics. We run a sustainable aquaponics farm. We also do commercial design, uh, complete aquaponics solutions. Um, for food systems at any scale. This is very scalable, um, so that's exciting. So design, construction, feasibility, and financial analysis uh, that comes with that. Um, daily, weekly, monthly operating procedures to really get you understanding, you know, what's the labor component involved? You know, what are the things I need to be doing? Do I hire this out? Um, all these types of things. We do um, system management and support too, so data capturing, looking at water quality and our environmental parameters and helping be a support network for you guys too when you get your farm going um, that you can fall back on us and we can help you if you're running into problems. So, and we're doing a lot of research and development. We've got some projects with local schools to help design the next generation of, of farming systems. So, uh, we strongly believe that aquaponics and other sustainable food production methods are essential to growing more nutritious nutritious foods, consuming fewer natural resources, producing less waste and emissions, feeding a growing population, mitigating climate challenges, uh, improving food security and access. You know, this is an important one that we talk about a lot at the Grow House, the, the nonprofit urban farm. Everyone deserves access to a healthy meal, not the privileged few that can afford it or get to it. And we work in communities that are food desert communities that don't have access to healthy food, okay? That's a basic inalienable right, is access to healthy food, not the crap that gets pushed on us. I'm going to try to tone it down, but maybe not. This crowd, I don't know, maybe you want me to get fired up. But, you know, <laughs> but seriously, I mean, the options for this neighborhood right out here is the 7-Eleven that's three blocks from us. That, a, they can only afford that food, if you want to call it that. You know, it's crap. And so it's poisoning our kids. It's poisoning us. We've got to start growing our own food. So this is, this is important. And helping these local communities um, you know, grow food for themselves, too. And of course, we can create jobs, which we talked a little bit about earlier. Uh, again, for people in this neighborhood right here that need jobs, jobs in local agriculture uh, are really going to be a significant thing. 
in Colorado, you know, we're an agricultural state, by the way, and we consume less than 2% of the food that we grow in state. So we're still importing most of our food from all those countries and locations I talked about earlier. We're importing all that food. We need jobs right here. Why not grow the food in this state right now? Okay? And help our farmers, too. When you look at the farmers, especially with the floods, you know, their fields are decimated. They're done. I mean, that oil is leached out onto the fields because of that flood. You know, we need to help our farmers and getting in the greenhouses, controlled environment, agriculture is going to be a way to help protect our food source. You know, hailstorms, climate changes, whatever, you know, controlled environment, agriculture, whether it's aquaponics or hydroponics or whatever, is really going to be an important part of the solution. So locally grown sustainable food production is the foundation the healthier eating healthier lifestyles and healthier more vibrant communities well thank you all i definitely appreciate uh your questions and taking the time to listen to me and look forward to talking to you some more thank you